Welcome to the Growing the Future podcast, where our future is always bigger than our past. Today, my guest is no stranger to the mic or the written word. He is helping entrepreneurs reframe their thinking to help them build a business that will run without them and a business that will sell for top dollar. He is coaching freedom, folks. Freedom. He has a trilogy of best-selling books. I happen to have them right here. In 2011, he wrote Built to Sell, where he encourages business owners to think about their business as more than just a job. The book spawned a company called The Value Builder System, which he is currently CEO of. This company has helped more than 50,000 businesses improve their value. I'm very interested in that myself. Uh, in 2015, he wrote The Automatic Customer to help businesses create recurring revenue. And in 2020, he wrote The Art of Selling Your Business, uh, which is based on interviews he's done with hundreds of entrepreneurs that have cashed out on top on his highly rated business podcast, Built to Sell Radio. Before he founded the Value Builder System, he sold four companies, including one that sold to a public company. You can find out more about him at www built to sell.com or on social his name is john warlow welcome to the show john hey thanks thanks for the the warm introduction i'm, <laughs> I'm so happy when you hold up the three books i'm like that's awesome <laughs> hey well you earned it man it's a great body of work and um it's really an operating system for for business owners that i think you could think about selling but you could also think about how do i want to be building a business that's scalable that doesn't need you to run with me I, I really love that when I when I listen to your audiobook built to sell so why did you embark on this journey John to help entrepreneurs to sell their companies you know I think it, we all teach what we want to learn and and I learned a long time ago that I was doing everything wrong I was running a a quantitative market research business when I built it up relatively well and it was I don't know, five or six million dollars in revenue maybe 30 employees and we had great client I mean beautiful clients like we were working with Microsoft and Apple and American Express these amazing businesses and I remember I went to see a guy named Perry Mielli in Toronto and I had the idea that I wanted to sell this company I thought I was sitting on this gold mine right and and I went to see Perry in his office and and I said, you know, what do you think it's worth? And he said, well, you know, it kind of depends on a couple of questions. Let me ask you. Number one, you know, your research company. So who does the research? And I'm like, well, that's my research guys. And he's like, really? <laughs> and I was like, all right, maybe I, you know, I'm still involved in some of the research. And he goes, okay. Question number two, who does the selling? And I'm like, my sales guys. And he's like, okay, so let me tell you, you're going you're gonna to win a client like Bank of America or American Express, and you're not personally involved in that? And I'm like, all right, sure. Okay, so I'm involved in the selling. And he's like, all right, let me get this straight. So you have a research business, you do the selling and you do the research, right? There's nothing here I can sell. I'm like, <laughs> Perry, it's a $5 million company. We're working with Microsoft and IBM. He's like, John, there's nothing I can sell. It's, it's worthless. <laughs> and I was, I was devastated. This goes back 20 years ago, but I was just like punched in the gut. Felt like I was, you know, just... Uh, reduced down to nothing. And hey, anyway, long story short, I, I worked with Perry and, and he taught me a bunch about what makes a company sellable. And uh, a couple of years later, we managed to turn it into a sellable business. It got bought by a publicly traded company. So it's a, it, it has a, a fairy tale ending to it. But the, that moment in Perry's office when he peered down his, you know, his nose at me, it's, uh, <laughs> there's nothing here to sell. It was a tough, tough pill to swallow. Don't you love when advisors look down their glasses at you? You, you know, something. Going they always on. seem to have glasses perched <laughs> right on the end of their nose. It's like, yeah. what's with the glasses? <laughs> well, and when they look over them, it has even more impact. But that's so you. That's interesting for you because the journey's been now that you've became the the mentor to the protagonist, Alex. You you sort of become Ted now to Alex, who in the story of built to sell is sort of under the thumb of a few big companies beholden to them. He's got a mediocre team. He's not quite keeping up with cash flow and his bills. And he's just on that treadmill that entrepreneurs find themselves on. So now you've gone to being from being the student to the master. That's really the progression, I suppose. Eh? 
<laughs> forever a student, man. I'm always a student, <laughs> which is, I mean, why I love the, the podcast. You, were, you, were, you mentioned Built the Cell Radio in the intro. I've done now 300 episodes, and I find myself curious with every single episode, wanting to know, like, how did you do that? And what I just did an episode with a guy who built a $30 million consulting business. Now, I've done a lot of work in professional services, so I feel like I kind of know what valuations are like in that space. The guy built it up. $30 million in annual revenue. He sold it for $162 million. It's like five times revenue. I'm like, I'm like how on earth did you sell? Like, it's it still bought. I, like, I, I talked to the guy for an hour, and I still can't figure out how he sold his company for that multiple. But in any event, I'm a forever a student of this topic. Yeah, he's an incredible hustler and built an incredible business. I listened to that episode, and it is. It, did you? Yeah. Oh, oh it's incredible. And every, in every story, there's the kernel of wisdom of how they did it and what they learned. And that's one of the things I think we've learned is, is going uh, with advisors and hearing how people who have gone before us have done is absolutely invaluable in your trajectory. So in your new book, you talk about uh, selling your business as an art. Why is selling your business an art, John? Well, because we're tempted to think of valuation as this science, right? Like, well, if you tell me how much revenue you have and how much EBITDA you have, I can tell you how valuable your company is. And, and of course, that's nonsense. I mean, you can value a company for the purposes of a family transition, for the purposes of a divorce. But really, when it comes to the ar ultimate arbiter of the value of your business, the market will determine that. You know, if I go back to Greg Alexander, the guy that sold his consulting business for $160 million, like a consulting business would trade at around one to maybe on the top end, 1.5 times revenue. He sold it for more than five times revenue. So clearly just using the kind of math and the science behind business valuation doesn't sufficiently recognize the art, you know, and, and, and the, the kind of dance that goes into successfully selling your business. I'll give you an example. One of the guys I interviewed uh, for the book and on the podcast is a guy named Eric Levy. And he built a company, uh, he's built two companies, one in which he was all science and no art, and the other in which he used the art. So the first company he sold, he did one, he got one offer and negotiated quickly and sort of fell into the arms of that one buyer. That's almost, almost always a mistake, by the way. The, the first offer he got was eventually retraded, which means that they renegotiated lower after due diligence, which is a very common thing that happens during a, when you have only one offer. And then when they actually finally agreed to a lower price, they turned around and make and said to Ari, look, I, I, Ari, I don't have the money to buy your business. I need you to finance it. And so here's our having accepted a lower price than he originally agreed to. Now he's having to finance it. In other words, lend them the money to buy the business. So that's that's what can happen when you have one potential acquirer. Compare that to the second business he sold where he, he ran a structured process like the one I lay out in the book. He got five offers and all of which were plus or minus 10% of each other. He then went about in a systematic way, trying to play one off the other in the, in the art form of it, the dance, the kind of nice. back and forth. And he ultimately tripled the value that he was able to get for his company from the original offers all the way to tripling through this sort of artful dance. And it is an art. It's not, uh, I, you know, it, it is a, it, there's a grace to it. There's a romance to it. And there's a way to do it that, that eventually, uh, I think you can really out, out, out maneuver the other side if you do it well. What are the elements of making it an art? Well, it's the whole book. <laughs> <So when you laughs> Read the book. Yeah, yeah. How much time okay, do you have? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll give you the audio book right now if you want. No, uh, <laughs> Hit play on the audio book. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, look, there's a way. I, I think it starts with how you position the company. So positioning is how acquirers will make a quick judgment about whether they're willing to invest time in learning about your business. And one of the big mistakes we make is we tend to lump ourselves into the wrong industry. And I know you're a strategic coach fan and, and Dan Sullivan talks a lot about this idea of, 
of, of don't just genericize yourself and, and say, I'm a graphic designer or I'm a, an accountant, because all of a sudden you lop yourself in with all the other people that look just like that. And when it comes, so that can commoditize your business because there's a market rate for your time if you're an accountant, for example, because you can compare it to the rate of other accounts. So it hurts you from a customer perspective, but it also can be problematic when you go to sell your company because some industries trade at much lower multiples. I'll give you an example. There's a guy I interviewed called uh, Jeffrey Feldberg who sold a company called Embanet. And Embanet was in the business of helping universities and colleges put their content online. And it started off as a basic web design shop, right? And acquirers have a bucket they put web design shops in. They're in the professional services bucket and they generally trade at a relatively low multiple, right? They think, you know, the assets go up and down the elevator every night. Uh, it's lumpy, it's squishy, it's just not worth very much. And so Jeffrey Felber got an offer of three times profit for his company. And he thought, well, like I want to do better than that. And so he started to think about how do I reposition the thing in an artful way to make it more attractive to an acquirer. And he realized that at the time, the e-learning space was exploding. Every acquirer, every strategic acquirer wanted a piece of the e-learning category. So instead of calling himself a graphic design shop or a web development shop, he evolved everything about the way he talked about his company in the marketplace to being a leader in the burgeoning e-learning space. Two and a half years later, he got an offer of 13 times EBITDA, hmm. almost four times the offer he'd gotten two years ago. Now, part of that is the business was, was better, it was doing better, it had grown, but I believe part of it was also just the way he was talking about the business, the way he was marketing the business effectively. And that's... That's an example of how the art of selling is um, is much more meaningful, and in some cases, than the science itself. I love it, and that theme lines up with the strategic coach concept of unique ability. And as I was listening to Alex's story in Built to Sell, where you took him from being a broad marketing agency to focusing on their unique jam, which was creating logos and, and, and productizing that process, getting them away from uh, being a service company, beholden to their customers. They, they created something that was highly scalable. How would a company go about that discovery process and how key is that to, to getting to, to selling? I take it, I guess the answer might be read the automatic customer. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, that concept is a little bit better elaborated in, in Built to Sell, the first book. But essentially, the, the, the idea is to discover your TBR, teachable, valuable, repeatable. What that means is that you look at all the services that you provide today, all the products that you offer, and rate them on three dimensions. The first is how teachable is that to employees? A lot of entrepreneurs are the industry expert. Like, they're the person who is the guru, right? And that can be very difficult to teach a young person or a new employee had to deliver. So think about all your services and ask yourself on a scale of one to 10, how teachable is this service? Next, the second item is valuable. So the, the way to think about valuable is the ar ultimate arbiter of the value of that product or service is in the eyes of the customer. In other words, the most commoditized products and services, the ones that sell for the, by the inch, by the pound, by the yard, whatever, are going to get the lowest score out of 10. Whereas the things that are very highly differentiated that you offer that nobody else offers, are you going to give it a 10 out of 10? And then the third attribute is repeatable. And that gets into the automatic customer. The idea of what is the, the need the customer has? Do they have a re repeatable, recurring need for this product or service? Do they have to buy it on a regular basis or is it a one-off? And once you do that, once you measure your products and services on this three dimension criteria, you're really just looking for the things that are highest on the list that score the most out of 30. And, and so that's really, really what you want to do uh, to, to figure out what is your unique process, so to speak. You said that you were once on a podcast where the first question was, are you a douchebag? Are you the douchebag <laughs> that wrote Built to Sell? I was going to open with that, but I thought, you know, it's already been done. It's already been done, so I don't need to do it again. But I thought that was kind of epic, but that's telling in the way that, is there not some sort of stigma 
around selling where a lot of you're trying to coach them and you want them to get it because I think at the end of the day it's really about your life your business should serve you not you be completely attached to the fate of your business which yeah. you know how quickly sideways it can go upside or down or in 3d space and go all over hell's half acre but what you're yeah, talking about I mean, teaching I, people is getting out of that that's exactly right that's exactly right i you're de you're describing a situation where i was on a podcast and the guy literally started off he's like okay warlow yeah you're the douchebag you wrote built to sell i was like what and, Yo, uh, yeah you should send me that link so we can we can put that in the in the, yeah, in the yeah. comments there yeah, well, of course, he was referring to, as you rightly point out, this notion that building to sell is somehow dirty. It's right. kind of sleazy. It's uh, grubby. It, it, it implies you're a money hungry. You know, and I, I, I didn't do a very good job at the time rebutting him at all. <laughs> However, since then, I, I have sort of thought about it and tried to come up with a, a more cohesive answer because I fundamentally, in my core, disagree with that principle. I think you're absolutely right that a business should be serving you, should help create uh, your freedom, uh, freedom over your time, who you spend time with, what projects you work on. I remember I did a podcast uh, with a guy named Joey Redner. So Redner was a great example of this. He built up a craft beer company in Tampa, Florida. And this was around the time that Sleeman's was you know, popular in, in Canada. All the craft brewery, breweries in, in the United States were popping up. And in Tampa, where Joey's from, there was no craft beer. And so Redner's like, I can make it. And he went to his daddy board, 600 grand, and built a, a very small brewing facility where he could brew the beer. Very capital intensive business. So 600 grand to get even off the ground. So he's, got, he's in hock to his dad. Tampa loves the beer, right? He sells it all kinds of the local bars. They think it's great to have their, you know, local guy, local boy done well, and it sells out. So much so that he's got to go build out his brewing capacity a second time. He's already in hock to his dad, but this time he goes to a bank and the SBA, Small Business Administration in the United States, guarantees the loan. So now he's in hock to his dad. He's a couple million in hock to the SBA, but he's got more brewing facilities. He's got more brewing capacity and he sells tons of beer and the beer just is flying off the shelf. Now he's a regional producer. It's all across Florida. Problem is he starts selling out a beer and he can't keep up with demand. And so a third time he gets asked to, the, the, the company is really demanding that he increase brewing capacity. And he kind of throws his hands up in the air and says, I'm out. I feel like the, the poker player in Las Vegas who's just won five hands in a row and the dealer's looking at him saying, put all your chips on the table again. <laughs> and he said, I can't handle the stress. I, I just want to feel free, to go back to your word, Dan. I, I want to feel free of the stress of being in debt and being beholden to this company that I've given so much of my life to. And long story short, Joey decided to sell and he sold to a private equity group. The, the beer has gone on to have tremendous success, gone way beyond where Joey would have taken it. And Joey's put some money in his jeans, bought himself a fancy house and feels free. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think you're batting your head against the wall year after year after year doing the same thing when you're just yearning to do something else. I think that's the definition of insanity. I think we should build a company as a as an entrepreneur. Your best years are always the first five or 10 where there's a premium paid on creativity and you know stick to itiveness and so forth. But once you get past the startup years, they're probably better people to run your company. And if freedom was why you started it, I think it's where it's 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 where we should all sort of aspire to go. Well, well said. Love it. Yeah. Do you think that, um, do you think, John, that uh, that is part of the catalyst for entrepreneurs to sell when they have that come to Jesus Eureka moment? Or what is the path to, to selling for the majority of entrepreneurs that you've been working with? Yeah. I mean, look, I think the, the two most common reasons that entrepreneurs uh, sell their company 
are number one, they have a health scare. So someone, either they themselves or, the, or someone in their family, direct family, has some sort of catastrophic health event and, they are, and, and, it, and, it, and it forces them to sell. The second reason is that they get approached by an acquirer. And in both cases, you're on your back foot, right? You haven't been on your front foot. You're in fact reacting to the situation. And so that's a recipe for disaster. When, when you get approached by an acquirer, um, they are trying to effectively sucker you into what's called a proprietary deal. And a proprietary deal is a bait and switch tactic they use in order to romance you into signing a letter of intent. So effectively, they call you up and they're like, wow, Dan, you're doing such amazing work. I can't believe the company you built. Why don't we sit down and talk about a partnership? You sit down and they're like, after an hour or so, they're like, man, we should we should think about being more strategic here. Have you ever thought of let, you know, uh, selling your company? You say, well, I've never really thought about it, but yeah, I guess I'd be open to that. And you are now about to get suckered into the bait and switch offer because they have you sign a letter of intent, which is when they make an offer to buy your company. But the letter of intent has what's called a no shop clause, which means you have to give up the rights to negotiate with anybody else. And once they get you to sign that, you lose all negotiating leverage. You've effectively given all of the power in the relationship into the hands of the acquirer. They do two things. They protract diligence. So it goes from what they say in the letter of intent from 30 or 60 days to 90, 120 days. And at the end, they often manufacture reasons to lower the price. It's exactly what happened to Arik Levy, the guy I told you about a few minutes ago. He got to the, the end and they dropped the price by 20%. I just did a podcast yesterday with a guy who was offered $54.5 million for his company. They went through due diligence and ultimately they agreed to $51 million. Now, you could say that's still a huge amount of money, but at the end of the day, he lost $4 million. That's a lot of money. And it was <laughs> lost. It was lost because he got suckered into a proprietary deal. And that happens when you're on your back foot, which is the biggest mistake I think most entrepreneurs make is, is they start the process when they get approached. Well, and that's why I love what you're doing so much because if we have this knowledge, if we have this gift of knowledge ahead of time, we can start to you know change our trajectory one degree at a time per month or per quarter where are we going to end up relative to those companies that have a health scare with the main owner who's doing most of the work or some company comes along, but you only get one chance to do that deal for that company. And you're suggesting that these more sophisticated players that are in the position of acquiring often have sophisticated tools that, that the seller might never have heard of before. I mean, reverse take backs and, and earn outs. And my understanding is nobody ever really gets an earn out because it's not that it's kind of like, you know, eating and then going to pay. It's not as fun as, you know, paying up front when you're hungry, right? Let's be real. <laughs> That's a great analogy. You know, um, yeah. no, who wants to pay an earn out two years later for something that may or may not have performed as well. It's hard to, it's hard to execute on the earn out. So you're saying there's all kinds of pitfalls that we can start to groom our company for regardless of the outcome, which leads to a better lifestyle in the meantime is I think my big takeaway from your work. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it leaves you like, look, I think there are two common denominators for most small business owners that I've sort of interacted with. One is the desire for freedom and the other is the desire for control. Control and freedom are those two, I think, common denominators that lace together just about every independent business owner I know, or they wouldn't be doing it on themselves. There's too many downsides to running your own business. If, if you were happy, you know, in, in, in working for Royal Bank, you'd probably go do that because it's certainly a safer way to, to run your life. Right. But I think we all work, want control and freedom. And building a business that can thrive without you doing the work, without you driving the tractor 18 hours a day. Like if it actually works without you, you have the ultimate poker hand in the game of life. You, you could sell it, but you don't have to sell it. You could bring in a manager to run the show. Uh, you could bring in a private equity group. You could sell it to the highest bidder and not have to sell because you, you're not burned out. I mean, it, it really gives you the ultimate control. And it starts, I think, with this idea that you 
need to structure your company so that it, it can thrive without you doing the work. I get it and I love it and I, I want to get there myself, but you've got these founders that are the specialists. They have the key big relationships, you know, the 20% of the folks that are 80% of the business in your, in your company. And, and you don't want to give up, even though you went into business to have freedom of purpose, time, relationship, and money as an entrepreneur, you get there and you realize, well, the only way I'm going to do this is to structure this damn thing. We're back to structure. So what are the the holdbacks, what are the pain points for entrepreneurs trying to get there? And do you work with entrepreneurs that just can't be coached in that regard? They just can't let go. They just can't let go of the vine. Yeah, look, I, I remember when I learned this lesson uh, the hard way and 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 it, and it stuck with me. So are there entrepreneurs that, that will never uh, get off the this, this idea of being at the center of their business? For sure. Uh, I, I think ultimately it, it's a relatively egotistical way to run your company. If your ego needs to be filled all the time by customer adulations, and, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's more of an indictment of your 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 you know, fragile ego than anything else. But anyways, I think it's it's important to build a company that is 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 not dependent on you. And again, I I recall I was. I was at a thing called the Birthing of Giants, which is a program for entrepreneurs run by EO. They've since rebranded as EMP. And we got a chance to hear from a ton of great speakers. Pat Lynn Shoney uh, talked about leadership and Jack Stack about employee ownership. And it was amazing. It was an amazing session. It was at MIT's Executive Education Center. And we were in this amphitheater style seating, right, where it goes up and down like a university uh, class and then guy in walks a guy named Steve Watkins. So Steve had recently sold the company and I almost skipped the session because I was sort of tired of the, the kind of rags to riches shtick. <laughs> and, and I hear, so, but I stayed for whatever reason and Steve walks in and he says, look, how many of you guys are involved in selling to your customers? How many of you guys are kind of the main rainmaker for your company? And like there are 62 of us in the audience, and I think every single one of us put our hands up in the air, right? And we, to your point earlier, Dan, like proud of that, right? Like we're the rainmaker. <laughs> Nothing happens without I'm us. I'm the big Driving dog. This for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 he said, "Great, put your hands down." And he chastised us. He said, "You've got all the right skills to be a great business owner, but you're selling the wrong product." hire salespeople to sell your product. You invest your sales and marketing skills into selling your company, building the value of your company. Because when you sell your company, you make a multiple hundreds or thousands of times more than every company, every customer you sell. Hire salespeople to do your selling. You inject your skills and all that you know about being a rainmaker into building the value of your company. And I've always, I mean, this goes back 25 years now or 20 years, but I've always remembered that lesson from Steve. And I think it's one we all have to learn at some point. I agree. I think it's making that shift to being a coach and a mentor from from being uh, having your sleeves rolled up and, and doing all the work yourself on that perpetual treadmill. John Collins on uh, Tim Ferriss the other day, having studied a, a vast data set of, of leaders a Fortune 500 companies, of course, they deal with public companies because of the amount of data that's available. You're actually working in that dark space to illuminate all these companies in between, you know, 1 million and, and what, 50 or, or a couple hundred yeah. million maybe, right? So it's kind uh, yeah, of because I mean, that doesn't get published, right? That's right. It's, yeah, and the sales of those companies are, yeah, are generally hidden behind non-disclosure agreements. So you never hear about them. Yeah, so what are you finding? He, he John Collins said what they found with leadership was that it was humility plus will that really made the qualities of a leader. What for you is the qualities of leadership that have macro trended in your hundreds of conversations with business owners that have exited? Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of the most successful exits are ones where the the person can, can sub subvert their personal ego. Um, they have somehow found a way to not make it be all about them. Now, 
that's not to say all business owners do that or successfully. I'm just saying the ones that have the, the most sort of spectacular exits, the ones that are multiples of revenue. I'm reminded of the guy who started um, a company called Grasshopper, which was a, an IP a telephone uh, company that, that used technology in the early days of the internet to route phone calls. I mean, it's an antiquated business now, but it was very, very successful at the time. He built it up to $30 million in revenue, sold it for 180 or so million. So uh, just a, you know, like a, a, an astronomical uh, valuation. But at the time of his sale, he was working less than one day per week in the business. Uh, built out a full management team. The guy I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, Greg Alexander, who had the consulting business he sold, he had had taken this to such an art form. It still blows my mind to even this day repeat it. Greg Alexander, this guy who sold a $30 million consulting business for $162 million, did not even meet the buyers of his business. <laughs> he had gotten to the point where he had the entire operations of his company running without him to such an extent that they even negotiated the sale of his business on his behalf, which right. again, blows well, my Well, they told mind. him to I've stay out of that. it, didn't they? Right. They wanted yeah. to stay it, out of it. It was great advice because the moment you, uh, you're you in the throes and the weeds of this, the negotiation of the sale of your company, um, you all of a sudden look like you're a very important piece of the of the pie, and therefore you're gonna you're gonna expose yourself to an earnout, which we talked about earlier. This this idea where you've got goals in the future as a division of of your acquirer's company. How much weight on your equation of success goes into grooming a company to to like your value builder system, getting to that point where you can shop it out versus surviving the due diligence, which I think is extra intense by the sounds of it. Yeah, the due diligence, I think you're absolutely right. It's it's survival as opposed to <laughs> it's it's less I think it's somewhat less art form. That you know, the 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 sale of a business generally has a couple of key stages. There's the letter of intent stage, which is where you are getting offers for your company and hopefully you've got a couple at least so you can you can kind of demand or or control it a little bit and sort of dictate the terms that you want. The diligence period is really about survival. It's it's really just getting through it. And and again, there are a lot of you know pitfalls to avoid. The, the most common though we've talked about earlier, which is this kind of concept of retrading. And I think one of the best examples or the best hacks I've heard about retrading comes from a guy I interviewed for the podcast called Barry Hinckley. And Barry uh, had learned this one the hard way. He had a the first company he sold. Uh, he took it to market, they agreed to a price, and 60 days later, the price was dropping like a stone uh, as it sort of started to bleed away. And so he said, I'm never going to fall victim to this retrading thing again. So he built this new company up called Bull uh, Bullhorn, I think is the name of it. And he negotiates tough and hard with lots of different buyers, and ultimately he gets to the point where they're just about to sign a letter of intent. And he walks across the boardroom to the most senior person on the acquirer's uh, side and says, I will do this deal with you on one condition. And the decision maker says, okay, well, what's the condition? He says, I'll do the deal, but there's going to be no retrading. And what he told me on the podcast is by saying that to the owner, to take the elephant in the room and actually name it and say that I would do this deal without retrading, it was communicating to that CEO that he knew the game, that Barry was a sophisticated seller and that he wasn't gonna fall victim to this trick. And, and he swears by that no retrading handshake as an essential element to ensuring that you can survive due diligence. The stories on your show are just epic. I mean, for anybody who's listening and wants more stories like that, I mean, this is, this is, you know, I, what I find fascinating about entrepreneurship is the fact that folks coming back from wars with PTSD, this is maybe one of the areas they can operate in that gives them some of that visceral feel, the highs and the lows, the, the having a mission. You know, a person without a mission is sort of a dangerous soul. And that's what I love about entrepreneurship is that, is that people are really on, on mission. What, your, your value builder system, walk me through that a little bit. What are the nuts and bolts of how that operates and how would it help build value in a company like mine? 
Yeah, so we work with entrepreneurs to help them improve the value leading up to an exit. One of the things that we will do is, as the first step in our process, walk you through an intake questionnaire, which basically takes about 15 minutes to complete. Now, the average business, when they start that, achieves a score of 59 out of a possible 100. That's the average score of someone <laughs> starting the process. We then take you through 12 unique modules, 12 yeah steps to building a more valuable company and at the end if you're able to get your score up to 90 or greater those are our sort of best performers our all-stars if you will those businesses on average are trading at 7.1 times pre-tax profit the average business when they start is trading at 3.5 times pre-tax profit so more than double for getting your score up to 90. So there's uh, there's a 12-step system that we take you through. It starts by figuring out your TVR, your Teachable Value or Repeal. We talked about that earlier. Uh, and then we walk you through the steps of, of building a more valuable company. We always believe in uh, growing the pie and, and collaborating and partnership. And, and, and that's one of the really exciting things that we're working on. How would you say the strategic sale maybe differs from you know, you mentioned Greg Alexander. One of his caveats was, look, I am gone. The day I get my check, I am gone. I've already decided I want to do other things in life. For me, I think what I'd be interested in is continuing to grow the pie bigger with, with folks. How does the strategic sale maybe different? Yeah, so look, there are three different types of buyers. There's an individual investor uh, who's usually just an individual who is changing jobs or is someone who wants to take over a family business, for example, it's an individual investor. The second is a private equity group. And the third is a strategic acquirer. And the strategic acquirer, to your point, is someone who has some assets that make your company more valuable in their hands than it is in your hands. That sounds, as I even say that, it sounds very esoteric. Uh, so let me give you a real life example. Uh, uh, one of the people I interviewed for the book was a woman named St Stephanie Breedlove, who built a company called Breedlove and Associates. They did payroll for nannies, parents who had a nanny to pay. And uh, they built it up to $9 million of revenue, 10,000 customers, ballpark. And she looked around and said, you know, like, I think I want to sell this company. And she looked at the universe of people who would pay more for her company, who would have a strategic reason to buy her company. And she discovered a company called care.com. I don't think care.com is in Canada yet, or maybe it is. I don't, I don't know. But in any event, care.com is like the Angie's list of care providers. You plug in your zip code, or your postal code, and it gives you a list of babysitters in your local market that are all rated by parents who've hired them. So it's a cool service. At the time, Care.com Care had 7 million subscribers. And so Stephanie Breedlove went to this organization and said, look, all of your subscribers, these 7 million parents need payroll, right? And we specialize in doing it just for nanny. So why don't you buy our company? Long story short, they made an offer to buy Stephanie Breedlove's company for $40 million. This is a this is a $9 million business. So again, the initial offer was way beyond the threshold of a normal valuation. This was a very uh, artful sale. But Breedlove, in her smarts, said, hold on a second. I think you're undervaluing the company at $40 million Because look, what if 1% of your 7 million subscribers buy my payroll service? That's 70,000 customers. We're a $9 million business on the back of 10,000 customers. 70,000 customers would make us a business seven times the size. <laughs> Long story short, Love she it. sells the company for $54 million oh, or six beautiful. times revenue. And what a That's great a service. strategic exit. <laughs> yeah, what, what a great service. What a great win for care. It's not like she hoodwinked them. She sold a great company to an even like a bigger company that has uh, virtually no way of losing even though they paid $54 million for the business because they had 7 million subscribers. So it's a win-win for both, but that's what I mean by a strategic acquisition. Well, you're helping folks find their way in business, which is not easy. And it's a dramatic perspective shift after you, after you listen or read, read built to sell it. Just, the light just goes off. It's just a lot of Eureka moments. I think the goal is freedom. The goal is freedom, folks, and uh, if you're interested in freedom, you should become an entrepreneur and check out John's stuff. John, you've got this body of work. 
you know, you've created this trilogy. It's kind of like the Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, <laughs> right? Like it stands alone and will only oh. grow in time. And it's uh, enigmatic, you know, fervor. You know, you got a lot of disciples as far as, as the content goes. And you've got a thousand consultants with this value builder, working with 50,000. I'm curious, where are you? Where are you headed? personally and professionally where where are you how much are you working what's your next big strategic partnerships what are you excited about how has COVID affected you like where's John Warlow at wow what a lot of questions COVID sucks <laughs> I'll tell you that right out of the gate <laughs> I'm locked in my home in Toronto which uh which has been tough uh, right. and and yeah and and look I think the the trilogy you're absolutely right I think it puts a bow on what I wanted to say on this topic I don't foresee another book. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really excited about where we're going with Value Builder. I think there's uh, you know, a couple million small businesses in Canada, 30 million in the US. Uh, we worked with 55,000 of them. So there's a lot more field to, to plow in that area. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm excited. I'm excited about that. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm going, focused on, on Value Builder. Well, I want to check out your system and I'm going to read all your books and we're going to be talking with the entire team. How much should you share with the team? Of course, the team is going to be listening to this podcast, but uh, <laughs> but it's not like I say, it's not about some grand exit, folks. It's about doing those things along the way that that get you there. The simple common sense things that maybe you didn't have the perspective to do before. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at for I'm looking forward to working with you with you on that. And I appreciate you coming on the show, John. It's, it's hey man, it's it was fun. It's it was great. great. Thanks it's for having great. me. All right, thanks so much, John.